Hey y'all, we are back with our study sessions three for the CRC exam. And I hope that you have at least started studying or outlining your study plan. So I'm going into my role of administrator here and just making sure that you're getting prepared and that you're getting some information from these videos, but also again, utilizing your manual, your study materials. I'll try to remember to keep saying it every study session so that even though, of course, I think these videos are great, you're going to need that additional uh, information or more in-depth information from your uh, study guide or study manual that you're utilizing for the exam. Now here is my um, area of interest that I love to talk about uh, that I used to teach on for a few years and it's talking about social and cultural, they saw it, call it social and cultural foundations um, in the study manuals for the exam but it's basically just multicultural counseling this area and excuse me this is an area that will always be and still is very near and dear to my heart so you'll probably see me moving around and using my hands a lot more when I'm discussing uh, these topics because this is an area where I like to teach and where I used to do a lot of study and research. So it wasn't until, let's see, probably about two years, two or three years ago when multicultural issues really became more pertinent in the exam. They might have had even when I took it, and it's been over 10 years ago now that I took the exam, and there might have been one or two questions in the multicultural area. But now, especially with them having a social and cultural foundations, you know, titled area in the study materials, you can see that it's become very uh, pertinent to the exam, as it should be, because these issues are very pertinent in the world and have been. So I was very excited to see more interest and more items in this area. However, with that being said, there's a lot of information for you to know in these areas because they're not only talking about racial groups. I think a lot of times when students hear multicultural, they just think of racially. And when we're talking about cultural groups, we're not just talking about black, white, Hispanic, Asian. Um, we're talking about those groups in addition to lesbian, gay, transgendered, deaf and hard of hearing, the elderly. So we'll be discussing those groups uh, as well. And so again, I'm very excited that they have been included as they should have been uh, years ago. So let's begin with just the basics of defining culture. It's defined as habits, customs, religion, art, science, all those things that en encompass a cultural group. They are dynamic. So saying that they're going to be changing and evolving. So things even that we talk about here today, they may still be the basis of a cultural group, but they can evolve from those things into more um, in-depth or deeper issues than what we're even discussing today. So they're always changing. It's constant. The dominant or major culture in a country is the macro culture. And then it's often contrasted with the smaller one, which is the micro culture. Learning the behaviors and expectation of a group is called acculturation. It means you're acculturating to a group. Emic versus etic. Emic approach is where the counselor helps the client understand his or her culture. Etic approach is where the counselor focuses on the similarities in the people, kind of treating people as the same, as equal. Low context communication and high context communication are going to be very important. And you'll see it when we begin to talk about the various cultural groups because communication styles start to differ there. Low context communication implies there'll be long verbal explanation. And a high context uh, communication relies on nonverbal, where they assume that you understand what they're saying without saying a whole lot, basically. 
Now it looks like my name here was cut off a little bit and I hate that but we're talking about let me go back we're talking about Afri African American culture is the first cultural group that we're talking about and the Census Bureau and this again the numbers remember keep in mind that cultural groups are dynamic and they're evolving and they're changing so even though the Census Bureau projects that by the year 2050 there will be more than 60 5.7 million African Americans in the United States that would take up 15% of the population. It could be more or it could be a little bit under that. So just keep those numbers in mind but remember that they will be changing and evolving over time. Now five years ago um, the population of African Americans was estimated over 42 million making up 13.6. So if we're talking about 2050 making up 15% I would think that it would probably be more than that 15%, but again, we just never know with, with everything that is going on in the world and the changes, and that's the great and interesting thing and can sometimes be the sad thing when you're talking about cultural groups. You just never know um, what can happen. Five identity operations, and I've, I've talked about these um, quite a lot when I uh, had my multicultural counseling course. And I always used to remind students, and I still remind my counselors, that these five identity operations, even though in most texts they're always put with the African American culture, they can fall under any cultural group. And we're talking about buffering, code switching, bridging, bonding, individualism. Um, it may be done more within the African American community or culture, but other cultural groups can use these identity operations as well, especially code switching. And not only in your cultural group, but even, you know, breaking it down to even more of a family unit. Code switching is where you would speak one way with a certain group of individuals, but speak another way with someone else. And I always used to use the example, and it still helps here when I'm uh, discussing this in classes, is that you will speak one way with your parents, but speak another way with your friends. And that's code switching. So this group uses code switching in the context when we're speaking of here is that they may speak one way when they're at work and with their superiors than when, when they're just at home and hanging out with their friends or whatever. But again, it's not just regulated to the African American community or culture. It, we can find variations of code switching and bonding and buffering within many different other cultures. Now the mental health challenges here with African Americans are usually, um, it's very dynamic as well because they can be over diagnosed in the, in, with mental health uh, areas but under diagnosed in the area of depression. Suicide can be very prevalent here. African Americans at this time and I would think it would even be a little bit more, would make up 40 to 44 percent of the homeless, nearly half of the federal inmates, and 45 percent of the children that are in state custody. African Americans or black people are more likely to use their faith, their religion, their spirituality, prayer, to cope with personal difficulties. And this is where I think it comes in with the over-diagnosis and under-diagnosis in the mental health arena because many times their faith and religion are taken in with their mental health. There's, they may be seen as uh, having a mental health issue because of being hyper-religious. That's the wording that you'll see a lot in, in different textbooks. And it's not always that, and not to say that it could not be that, but just because it's so much of a foundation in this community that their prayer and their faith is used within diagnosing many mental health issues, and that's where it comes into them being over-diagnosed, when it may not actually be a mental health issue. It's just that they're them praying, 
or relying on their faith and their beliefs um, will be taken into context when diagnosing mental health. Okay, now we're talking about the Asian American culture. According to the U.S. Census in 2000, those who identify as Asian Americans comprise 3.6% of the American population, approximately 10 million individuals. Now the Census Bureau projects again with that 2050 that they will grow to 37.6 million individuals comprising of 9.3% of the population. Now some of the elements of the Asian worldview are humility, interpersonal harmony, self-restraint, and obligation to family. This is where you will probably more likely see that high context communication. They will not say much because they'll assume that you would understand what they're saying by other types of communication. They, um, their experiences of psychological distress or their coping mechanism could be seen as there's a lot of stress with them being seen as the model minority. Usually the, there's, uh, people stereotype them as the ones who are going to be successful. They don't do anything wrong and again that's where that model minority and that can, can be very stressful for them, cause them a lot of distress. Um, understanding racism and discrimination or some issues of psychological distress and immigration experiences, of course. This cultural group tend to be or tend to prefer more crisis-oriented, brief, again, we're talking about that high context communication and solution-oriented approaches rather than insight and growth. When you're talking about insight and growth, what do you usually think about? You're going to have that long psychoanalytical type of approach or theory and that is going to involve a lot of talking and working through issues and that's not an area where they tend to go. They want to tend to address what is going on, find a uh, resolution, and have it done and move on. So we have some more cultures to discuss in our next uh, session. We're still on study session three, but it'll be part two. So I'll see you back in just a minute.